to Sugar Coated. I'm your host, Adrian Garland, the CEO and founder of She Leads Media. For far too long, women have been conditioned to sugarcoat their words, their actions, and the way they show up in the world, and to conform to certain cultural norms and ideals. This is inherently designed to keep those who are outside of the norm from gaining power, prestige, wealth, and influence preventing more women from being recognized and respected as the powerful leaders that we truly are. Join me each week as we dive into raw conversations with remarkable, uncompromising, and inspirational women that will encourage you to strip away your sugar coating and move boldly in the direction of your magnificent dreams. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Sugar Coated. I am your host, Adrian Garland, and I am very excited to introduce my next guest to you. Her name is Kristen Butler, and she's the CEO and founder of The Power of Positivity. She's also the best selling author of the Three Minute Positivity Journal and the author of a soon to release book called The Comfort Zone Create a Life You Really Love with Less Stress with less stress. (laughs) That's it. She is also head of a global community of millions of people. And she is an embracer of the power of positivity. So welcome to Sugar Coated, Kristen. Thank you so much for having me, Adrian. I am so excited for you to be here. And I'm so excited for you to kind of share with us your concept that I think is is revolutionary or disruptive around the comfort zone, right? So this whole idea of the fact that the comfort zone is something that we hold up as negative, and you are saying, no, 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 the comfort zone is actually Good. So can you tell us a little bit about who you are, how you started the power of positivity, and this whole new concept of the comfort zone? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm the CEO of Power of Positivity. And I started it about 14 years ago. And it was because I was suffering from rock bottom. Before that, I was at rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me to even embrace positivity in that place because, you know, I was stuck. I was in that place. I was depressed, obese. I had lost my business. I had a thriving eBay business. I was a power seller at that time, decade and a half ago. And I came to a point where it was like, you can either give up Kristen or you can do something different. And before that, I was always stepping out of my comfort zone. I was always pushing myself. I was hustling. My schedule Mm. was full. I was prioritizing and chasing success. And I thought that at one point it would lead me to a road of happiness or something would be enough. But my my overaction always led to more action. So Mm. it led me to a place of burnout and rock bottom and positive thinking really got me out of that. And I started prioritizing things that felt good to me in that moment. I stopped shaming myself for where I was in my situation. And I started embracing comfort instead of rejecting it and thinking that it would keep me from success. Mm -hmm. I was always told, step out of your comfort zone, Kristen. You know, success doesn't come easy. And pain and sacrifice and discomfort will give you a better life. And I wanted a better life. I had grown up in poverty. And so I had these huge dreams in my heart and I wanted to accomplish them. And so in that place of rock bottom, I just started prioritizing my own needs, Mm -hmm. taking care of myself, you know, nourishing my mind. And it took one day at a time, right? I mean, it was 14 years ago, but Every time I spoke a little gentler to myself, was a little kinder, I started to feel better. And that momentum continued to build. And I started applying it to every area of my life, mind, body, and soul. And it just completely transformed everything. And I started the power of positivity simply to start to share this message with people that a positive lifestyle can, is truly transformative that these positive emotions have such an effect on 
who we are, our business, our relationships. Yeah, I just started it with just the desire to want to connect and help people because I knew how it felt to be at such a low place, place of wanting to give up. And I wanted to help people who might feel even a little bit like that. It's just a really uncomfortable feeling. Yeah. Kristen, I, I, I'm just listening to you speak and I, I know that so many people can relate to what you're saying. It's making my mind spin around all of these messages that we've been fed, you know, growing up, how we've been socialized it, it, to exactly what you're saying. And I think that it's so prevalent here in the United States. It's the concept of, you know, work hard, grind it out, keep going until you, you know, fall over. And that is the only path to success. And I have, it's funny because I have um, started to see a little bit, and I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to seem so out of touch, but it's, I don't know what it is. It's like the the like casual girl like thing or something on social media where people are starting to embrace kind of relaxing. And I think that your message, especially now, is more important than ever because I think the pandemic brought to light the fact that this whole hustle and grind culture that it's not that it doesn't get you results, right? Because it does. But it goes to that place of toxicity. Yes. And I think we realized that more than ever during that pandemic time. Like the thing that happened also, I think, which went the other way is some people, including myself, went almost too much comfort, right? So like chocolate chip banana bread is very comforting, (laughs) But not if you're making a loaf and eating it every night. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. My version of the comfort zone is not like a zone of inaction. I call that in my book, the complacent zone. Mm. So I think we confuse comfort and complacency. And complacency is really not a comfortable place. So I don't know why we're calling it that. Mm. Usually when you're complacent, you feel stuck. You Mm. know, you might be riddled with negative emotions or fears, at least for me when I was complacent and it led me to rock bottom. I was just, I was afraid to fail again. And I was hard on myself and I didn't want to take action because it was like, why bother? I'd rather like do nothing than, than do something and fail again. So to me, comfort should be a comfortable place. And I'd love to kind of redefine our relationship with comfort because if we're working so hard every day for eventually comfort, then why don't we enjoy the journey now and take time for that now? Because if we shame ourselves now, then we're never going to get there. You're never going to get somewhere that you're shaming yourself for. It's It's a mindset shift, but it's so important. Yeah, I I really love the difference between comfort and complacency because I do think that we mix up those two terms. And when we think you have to step outside of your comfort zone, you know, you have to get, I even say it, I say it all the time, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's probably <laughs> not. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that statement. Thing. It's like, we are expanding our comfort zone. And so when when we're going when we're growing, we're gonna feel a little bit of discomfort. Think about when you stretch. It's it brings a little discomfort, but if you stretch too much, you're gonna hurt yourself, right? Yeah. Yes. And but if you stretch just enough, you're gonna provide relief because we love trying new things and doing new things. That's actually like innately built into us, I feel like. Yeah, it it helps us to evolve. Yeah. When we look at children or we're pursuing a new passion, we have so much energy, right? And we want to keep that going. And that's really the goal of the comfort zone is keeping that passion and fire going. Mm. You know, I want to, I want to, um, dive into a little bit, not not to bring up anything negative, but because our audience is filled with women entrepreneurs that are doing things, starting businesses, and even that because, again, we were socialized to maybe not step into our entrepreneurial selves, right, to go work with someone else and have them tell you what to do. There is a lot of fear around starting a business and then thinking that that business could fail, right? Because what Mm -hmm. happens, and it sounds like what happened with you is 
when the business failed and because you your identity was so caught up with the business, you were one and the same, when it failed, you felt like a failure. And so how did you kind of pull those things apart so that you realized like that business failed probably because of timing and technology and and many other reasons that have nothing to do with you. And how did you say, well, that business didn't work, but now let me see what I can move into next. What was that mind shift for you? Yeah. Yeah. I love that because I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. Even when I was a child, I was like selling bracelets at the playground. So I totally (laughs) get it. Like when you're an entrepreneur, you just like have that desire to be an entrepreneur, but it can be scary. Right. And so I had had several kind of like businesses where I did like MLM things. Right. And then, you know, I had that business and yeah, I put everything into it. Mm. And that's the thing is I put everything into it, my whole heart and soul and literally all the hours. I didn't Mm. have balance. Mm. And so when I lost it, I felt like I lost myself because I had put everything into it. And I feel like we want to have work-life balance and it's important so that our whole value of who we are doesn't go into our business. It's a part of us, but it's not the whole thing. And when we have that balance, when something goes wrong, we're able to adapt and kind of Um, Even now with my business, 14 years, we've had ups and downs, a lot of ups and downs, but my identity isn't in the business. And I know that I'm going to be able to overcome it. I think over time, you start to realize like, wow, there's going to always be ebbs and flows. And even if something ends, that must not have been like what I was meant to do. Like, for example, the eBay store, I learned a lot from that, but that obviously wasn't my you know, my purpose fully, I learned from it to work towards my purpose. But I feel like our purpose can always change. And when a business ends, and you really look back at it, maybe there were warning signs. Like I feel like for me, there was totally warning signs saying, hi, hello, you know, stop, you know, and I wasn't listening. So Mm -hmm. if we can think about the bigger picture and that maybe we have something else and value to provide somewhere else, the perspective is the biggest thing really there. Yeah, gosh. And it makes me think that if you sort of don't heed those warnings, you're preventing that thing that's next that could really bring lots of joy. You're preventing that from happening. So it's definitely... I think, really smart to be able to take some time, take a step back, evaluate things. And what you were talking about before, too, as far as, you know, with your business and and your identity, I even suffered that not from an entrepreneurship perspective, but I had been in corporate for my entire career. And I did, you know, really well in corporate. I had great positions and everything. And uh, my last corporate job really did a number on me. And I ended up leaving, not under great circumstances. And I suffered a huge identity crisis because I thought, well, if I'm not this, you know, hot crap, (laughs) you know, corporate person that is successful and makes a certain amount of money and everything, then who am I? And being an entrepreneur and, you know, it didn't matter what role I had in in corporate, right? You have to go out and, you know, deliver value and, and make money. And when that didn't happen for me in the same way that that success happened for me in corporate, I I really was in a dark place. And it took me like, I don't even know if I'm still fully recovered, but it took me a very, very long time, over 10 years in order to sort of, you know, get over it and and have my confidence back. And I have a, a very wonderful, wise friend who's a therapist, and we talk a lot about, you know, just entrepreneurship. And, and one of the things that she sort of warned uh, with entrepreneurs is she said she hears so many, especially women, say, my business is my baby. Mm-hmm. And she's like, can you imagine if you're, biz- if you're treating your business like your baby, the one that you want to give comfort to, you're not going to make smart business decisions. So she's like, cut it out right now, calling your business your baby. Your business wow. is there to support you. 
right? I love that. That's oh. a wow. That's really eye opening there. Oh, that's amazing. It's yeah. And so stepping good. into that, the business is there for you. And that's truly a really good power play because if you are kind of nurturing it that way, then when you lose it, you will grieve and you'll feel like you can never recover. Exactly. That's an amazing, that's amazing insight. I think I probably also used to say that same thing. Yeah. Could you imagine if you lose that, the grief and exactly. how long, maybe forever. Like that's amazing. I love that she said that. Wow. Yeah. It, that has stuck with me. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, that hit hard and it stuck with me. And I love this, like this perspective of, you know, you have to be passionate about your business to, to start it and everything, but it's like, use your passion as fire and then immediately separate it from yourself as your identity because wow. you want to be able to make those smart business decisions because we're we're smart women that know how to make smart business decisions but when it comes to emotions it muddies the water and we make we make decisions that might not be the best for our business but maybe they're good for you know the person that's working for us or maybe mm. you know they're good for our kids or right like cuz yeah. they'll give us more time so it's like we really need to do we we need to do some thought work i think around that like even if it's an arms length distance separation yeah totally uh, yeah. i love that Mm. Yeah, so good. So you you developed this whole entire book and everything. When did you sort of realize that this was a revolutionary concept, right? Right off the bat in your book, you 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 say that the comfort zone has never been explained like this before. Yeah, absolutely because it I for me, I've never heard it in this way and I wish I would have, you know, it would have saved me so much, but I can't reflect on that. I just have to say, how many people can I help today? Because how can we shame ourselves for something that we're actually trying to prioritize in our life someday, right? It's like comfort is so important. Of course, as you mentioned, too comfortable, but there's definitely a difference. So When I first started prioritizing my own needs and comfort, I was in a place before I was a people pleaser. I wasn't really like, I was just really almost obsessed with my business and my goals. Mm. And I didn't have that balance. And when I did start prioritizing comfort and what felt good and where my path led, that alignment to where I should be going, things started to change and rapidly and create momentum. And I thought, wow, what a shift you know, Mm. but I was harnessing my power. And I realized like the comfort zone is really your power zone. It's not something I should have been scared of this whole time with resting and taking a break. It actually let me be in the flow more and it Mm. let me have access to what my purpose is here. So mainly I actually shamed myself at first. I didn't really share it with anyone because I thought, wow, this is going against what everyone says, but this is working for me. So I'm going to kind of keep this to myself. And then about eight or nine years ago, I did a writer's workshop with Hay House and Reed Tracy and Wayne Dyer led Mm. it. Wow. And he said, he talked about how powerful your story is. And I thought, you know, wow, what if I shared, you know, the power of this story in the comfort zone. And he also mentioned, you know, we all have something inside of us that no one else, you know, can see from that perspective. You know, he shared all kinds of amazing golden nuggets, but really gave me the confidence to start writing about my findings. And then it wasn't until about three years when I said, this is time, this book needs to come out. And it doesn't matter what anyone thinks. I know that this works and I would research and see that I noticed that other people were applying the same technique to their lives and they were living happy, successful lives. They might have thought they were stepping out of their comfort zone, um, but to me, they actually weren't. So I started really prioritizing writing this book and I'm so glad I did because I'm having such positive feedback around it, even though it's so against what we've been told all these years. Yeah. And I do think that there is something in the air and your book is coming out at that perfect time because I I do think that people are realizing that we are human beings. Mm. You know, we are not machines. We are not made in order to just keep going, going, going. There's a, there's a time for pushing forward and then there's a time 
for rest. And, you know, you, you think about even running a race, right? There's sprinters, right? You want, you, you get to a point and you, you sprint and then, and then you kind of slow down, right? Or there's the, the marathoners that I like to think about that th- maybe they go at a little bit of a slower pace, but it's consistent over the, mm. the long term. So that's what it sort of reminds me of, right? You're going to, you're going to finish the, the marathon either way. But it really depends on on what your it's almost like what your constitution is, right? Like I consider myself a sprinter. Like I like to go, 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 go. But then, and I think, and I'm saying this because I'm thinking about when I put on a conference, right? I, I do all of this stuff. I'm like a maniac. And then when the conference is over, I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to go on vacation. And I don't want to talk to anybody at all. I need to really decompress. And that works for me. That's the way that I work. And that is my comfort area. That's, That's how I do well. Yeah, I love that because you're so passionate about what you're doing. You can be in the flow and you can get a lot done and you can do hard things. It's not saying you can't, but then you prioritize yourself after and you say, I'm setting these boundaries. I'm not talking to anyone after and that's okay. And the people who know and love you, they're like, yep, we know it's okay. (laughs) I mean, um, and and I love that balance too. I'm doing the same thing with this book. You know, I love this book and I want to help as many people, but then I'm going to take time for myself when I need to, too, you know? Yeah. And that message needs to come through loud and clear, especially for women, right? Mm-hmm. We we are so busy taking care of everybody else. We need to put that time and attention and care on ourselves so that we can be the best. And I, I feel like that's the message too of the comfort zone, right? You 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 literally need to comfort yourself. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yes. Because that that's where we can build our self-esteem. You know, that's where we can have our confidence and even our body and our nervous system loves when we're comfortable. If we're stressed out all the time, you know, it does such a, it, for me, it did such a damage to my nervous system and my, my hormones. And physiologically, it was just so depleting on me and and most people, we can't live like that forever. And it's just not even a fulfilling way to live. Yeah. And I I haven't had the benefit of finishing reading your entire book. And but something that you said earlier made me think about something. And it's true. You're you're talking about it a little bit right now, too. It's like when you're operating in that point of stress, and we all need a little bit of of stress, right? We're not talking about just laying around all the time. Oh, absolutely. But even when it comes to like food and eating, right? Like I do believe that your body knows best. So I think we're so obsessed with what other people are telling us what to do, how to eat, how to exercise. And it seems to me that this message of comfort is to really tap into you and your body knowing when is the time to to get up and move? When is the time to rest? Even eating food, if you are eating something and you're feeling guilty about eating it as you're eating it, I, I just, I can't imagine that, that that is good for you. Yeah, you said it perfectly. I mean, I, a decade and a half ago, I was obese. So I completely understand the psychological effects. Even when I was eating healthy, I would tell myself I wasn't eating healthy enough, or maybe it was too much, or I should have ate something else. And we beat ourselves up at that inner conversation really dictates almost over our actions sometimes. And if we can get in alignment with ourselves and stop listening to the voices outside, I mean, if the voice is nurturing and feels good and we trust that person, great. I'm not saying not to listen to other people, but we want to follow our own rhythm foremost and and follow that and that's with eating moving our bodies because we're always at different places in our life and i think that yeah. when we honor that and know like sometimes i'll do intermittent fasting and sometimes i won't or sometimes i'll do yoga and so, or sometimes i'll go to the gym and when i tap into what my body needs versus what someone else is saying totally makes a huge difference you're exactly right 
Yeah, I I love that message so much. And it's it's only as I've gotten older that mm-hmm. I've started to notice that that's sort of the way that things work, you know. And I did notice it, especially, this is like a funny thing. You know, my mother, she makes these cookies around Christmas time and they are like, People talk about them. They're so good. There, there are these jelly cookies with walnuts on them, and they Ooh. are like, oh my god! They, like people from far and wide, like ask my mom, mom to make these. They're so damn good, and I eat them. And I usually eat like a ton of them, but I feel like my mom made them, and like even though they're like butter and sugar, like all the bad things for you, no matter how many co- of those cookies I eat, I never gain weight because I'm like. My mom made these. So they're like, I love they're that. good. You yeah. know, and they make me so happy. <laughs> so I can I can eat an awful lot of them, although I do have to like limit myself sometimes because they are a little bit like crack. But uh yeah. <laughs> so but I but I see I see that happening. I'm like, hmm, I you know, I eat a lot of those cookies. <laughs> and it, you know, it's it's fine. So the thing that I wanted to kind of shift to, because I, I hear about this a lot, is sort of the other aspect of positivity, right? There, there's a lot that is, you read online about this idea of toxic positivity, right? So can you talk about up until what point can you be positive and then where does it become toxic? Because you wouldn't think that positivity could be toxic, but I guess it can't. Yeah, I feel that the toxic positivity people are talking about is when we're ignoring our feelings or just like we have them and we're just stuffing them down. So for me, uh, living a positive lifestyle is actually healing and getting those emotions out. I, I've done like RTT and, you know, I will journal. Journaling's really healthy. We want to get those feelings out and really just look at them, accept them, and then release them, move Mm. through them. When we can move through them, they're not stuck in our body. There's so many books on like, you know, Louise Hay has, you can heal your life. And then the body keeps score that our, uh, I think there's even the emotion code. I love so many books on like what our emotions do and they're in our body and we want to get those out. So Mm. toxic positivity to me is just kind of ignoring those feelings and, and letting them sit what I offer is let those out, heal them, release them, move through it and find gratitude. That's the Mm. simplest way to move through something because there's always an opportunity for the good and the bad. And it's really our perspective. So it's really the easiest way to move through something very difficult is to eventually, once it's released, find something that feels good and that you can be grateful for. Even if it's as simple as my hands Mm. or my breath, you know, Mm. very simple. It doesn't have to be this big thing, right? Yeah. I really love that. I was going to ask, you know, what can people do to kind of start if they're feeling like, you know, maybe they're at rock bottom, maybe their businesses aren't everything that they wanted it to be, or that, you know, they feel like they're going down the wrong path. What can someone practically do in order to to start honoring themselves a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, I really think gratitude has been as as simple as it is. And I know so many people talk about it, but it's it's even still something that I use today when I'm like, oh wow, today's been a little difficult. And I can move through that find using gratitude in such a beautiful way. In fact, I used to write a list of 10 things in the morning and write a list of 10 things at night. And, and then it got down to three. And then now literally I wake up and I, my body has trained, is trained to just feel grateful. And what am I feeling grateful for in my environment? And then moving through the day, just feeling grateful for what's around me, what I've intentionally created. You know, it's something that we build up to, but gratitude just is just so transformative. It's Mm. kind of just thanking life for what is still going right. You know, like, okay, you know, this and that, and that could be going wrong, but what is actually still growing right? What can I hold on to? And Mm. and it builds from there. And even Mm. if it's something small, like when I was in bed for two weeks, it was literally that I had a bed and then it became, okay, I have one person that cares, you know, in that moment, I didn't think anybody cared. I I didn't Mm. even think I had anything worth living for. 
So we just mm. have to look at those small things that maybe we're not thinking of in that moment. And if it's with your business, like what is an aspect that is going right? Or who's somebody that is very valuable to you in your business? You know, there's so many different ways that we can look at it and everyone's mm. situation is different, but it just is so powerful, truly. Yeah, this is so good because I think that what it does, and I think you talk about this, is that it sort of retrains your brain to look for the positive. Yeah, absolutely. It really does. And it, it helps during challenging times. For example, I was at Disney at Halloween a few years ago, and I went to the bathroom and I left my wallet in one of the stalls. And it was about a half hour when I realized that I had lost my wallet. And I said to my friend, I let her know. And she said, oh, I'm at Disney all the time. Like, you're probably never going to get that back. Like, that's just like a thing, you know, and you're just going to have to deal with that and get a new license. You know, all the, all of my things were in the <laughs> wallet and I would, you know, it took the airplane and I'm like, Oh, that's not a reality that I want to buy into. So I said, no, I'm, I'm sure a good person has handed my wallet in, right? You know, because there was two perspectives in that moment that I could choose. Long story short, we eventually found out that someone turned my wallet in. The money was still there. The cards oh. were there. The ID was there. Wow. And it could have been a very stressful situation. And in that moment, the old Kristen would have said, like, wow, you're right. Like, people aren't trustworthy. I'm not even going to try. But I took the opportunity and chance to say, hey, maybe there's a good person in this world. And they turned it in. And they did. And Uh it doesn't always happen like that. But I really love that story because I had really two paths, you know, in that moment. And, And I think sometimes when we do choose that opportunistic moment, we can find the good and can find the positive by doing so. Yeah. And I I love that so much too, because I I, I say this to my kids sometimes. It's, It's like, don't let that situation like steal your joy, right? However you're looking at this, the only person that you're like harming is yourself, right? So is it worth it to get all worked up over these things? Like, yes. Would it be a pain for you to have to cancel all the credit cards and go? Yes. But, you know, it's not like you fell off a ride at Disney. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Even if I didn't find my wallet, yeah, it still could have been way worse. (laughs) It could have been way worse, right? So, and it's like, you don't want to be thinking about like the worst case scenarios and then be grateful like back from there. But yeah, no, yeah. But at the end of it, like in the end, it's plastic, it's, you know, leather or whatever. It's, it's, it really, in a lot of ways, is meaningless. And the money that's in there, you can always make it again. And yeah, yeah so it's like being able to have that perspective, I think is, it, it is almost a superpower. And I think you don't want to brush over the fact that, yeah, like it's, it's upsetting. Oh gosh, I, I should be lesson. I should be more mindful of, you know, or putting the things down, or maybe I need to buy myself, a, you know, something that I'm wearing all the time. So that doesn't happen, whatever it is, like, take a lesson from it. But also don't let it like completely, like ruin your experience. Your, your yeah. experience. Yeah. I feel very grateful because I I feel like I was in many ways brought up like that, not to look at the positive side of things all the time, but to be able to really look at a situation and say, is it that bad? Mm. You know, like, can you at least get through this for right now and don't let it like, don't let it take you down. And I think that for me, the whole like coming out of corporate and and how that I did, I, I let it get the best of me. I, instead of saying like, no big deal, I don't work at the company anymore. Who cares? Like now I can do whatever I want. I let it mean something else for some reason. I don't know why, but it is a power. It is, you, you say the power of positivity. It literally is yeah. a power. And I think that you needed that time to kind of grieve. As you said, it was like your baby or no, or no. What did you say? Something about like, you kind of put your whole self into it, your identity, you put your whole self into it. And so grieving is like a natural thing. You let yourself grieve. And Mm. 
in that time, I think if we shame ourselves for rest or shame ourselves for our feelings, that's when it's a problem. Yes. And we need to kind of be there, sit with it, and then move forward when we're ready. And there's really not a timer over our head saying, hey, this is how long it takes. Everyone's different and every situation is different. Yeah. So Kristen, this has been an amazing conversation and I want to let people know how they can find your book, find you, connect with you. Can you please let everybody know? Yeah, absolutely. To connect with me personally, um, I have a new website, positivekristen.com. And there's some cool things on there, a quiz to find out maybe if you're in your comfort zone or not. You can follow me on social media on there. I have all the uh, buttons and everything for them. And then the book, uh, thecomfortzonebook.com. And I have lots of great bonuses on there for pre-ordering. When does the book come out? Yeah, the book comes out April 18th. So I'm going to leave the pre-orders there during launch week because I'm going to be hosting a masterclass that I'm so excited about to offer. So I'm going to leave that up as long as I can till the seats are filled. Oh, that is amazing. Well, congratulations on writing the book and having this experience and just sharing your gift with the world. I know that I benefited from our conversation today and I can't wait to finish the book. So thank you so much for being on the podcast with us today and we will see you soon. All right. Thank you, Adrian. Adrian. 